Well, my name's Tom McCulloch, and I'm the joint CEO of Community First Oxfordshire. And thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. I hope that you and yours are doing well in these in these strange times. So alongside me tonight uh, is my fellow CEO, Emily Lewis Edwards, and the person we're all here to listen to, of course, uh, Dr. Freddie Otto, Associate Director of the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. I'll pass over to Freddie in just a few minutes, um, but first, just a few introductory remarks from myself. So this is the second of Community First Oxfordshire's centenary webinars following Will Hutton last night, and tomorrow we're joined by the Shadow Chancellor, Annalise Dodds. I'm sure there's lots of you out there watching tonight who are uh, aware of what Community First is and what we do, um, but by way of a brief introduction, uh, we're a community development charity, which helps communities and individuals to identify issues that affect them and to find their own solutions. Um, we support and advise volunteer-led actions, helping hundreds of people fulfill many roles in their communities. And we also run research and consultancy services in planning and placemaking. 100 years ago tomorrow, the 8th of October, 1920, Oxfordshire Rural Community Council came into being. That was a previous name for Community First Oxfordshire. And back then, Britain was still reeling from the, the trauma and the fallout of World War I, and the country was also recovering from the Spanish flu pandemic. Um, a century on, with eerie symmetry, COVID-19 finds us in the midst of a public health emergency of similar magnitude. In between times came the a depression of the 1930s, another world war, and the huge social changes of post-1945 Britain. More recently has come austerity. And across the years, CFO has tr strived to adapt our services to help provide what communities need to meet their challenges. And there are certainly some big issues affecting us right now. So it seems fitting on our centenary to host online talks with uh, experts on some of those big topics to explore how we can best and collectively deal uh, with them. The climate emergency, uh, which Freddie's going to talk about tonight, is certainly one of them. Um, in fact, it's not going too far to describe it as the existential threat facing humanity. Mirroring the, the slow rise across the decades in awareness and activism regarding climate change, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, it's only been in the last couple of decades that Community First has more effectively began to focus on these issues and support communities to do something about them. For many years, we've run a community planning service, so supporting communities to reflect, to reflect upon, research, identify, and address a range of issues. And there's been a clear increase in recent years in community-led projects to address climate change. A more recent tool, planning tool is neighborhood planning, which focuses on the development of community-led spatial planning policies. And in recent years, we've noticed a marked upsurge in neighborhood planning groups wishing to address the climate emergency by writing policies to facilitate low carbon buildings, alternative energy schemes, undertake green infrastructure strategies and roll out biodiversity initiatives. More and more town and parish councils are also declaring a climate emergency. And beyond CFO, Oxfordshire has a huge range of environmental and climate action taking place with the network of community action groups, for example, one of the most extensive in the country. And what's becoming increasingly clear is that more communities and individuals are recognizing both the urgent need to respond to the climate emergency and doing something about it. And at the same time as undertaking local actions, they're becoming more vociferous in their demands to local authorities and national government to go further, faster and sooner. And I'm hoping that Freddie perhaps uh, tonight can help us explore and understand how these, all these interconnected community actions can become a bottom up driver of systemic change. So just before I pass over to Freddie, um, just a quick word about webinar logistics. Um, Freddie's going to talk for about 30 minutes or so and is happy to pick up questions 
afterwards. If you've got a question or a comment, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And Emily will be keeping a, an eye on what's coming in and we'll pose these questions to Freddie after her talk. And we'll close the webinar at, at eight o'clock. So that's enough for me. Just a quick few words of introduction about um, Dr. Frederico Otto, a very distinguished academic. Um, Freddie's associate director of the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford and an associate prof professor in the Global Climate Science Program. She leads several projects understanding the impacts of man-made climate change on natural and social systems. Her main research interest is in extreme weather events, so improving and developing methodologies to answer the question whether and to what extent external climate drivers alter the likelihood of extreme weather. And Community First is really pleased to rekindle this connection with Freddie and the Environmental Change Institute, um, having worked with them in previous years on an Oxfordshire-wide low carbon communities project. So over to you, Freddie. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just, uh, yeah, share my screen um, because I have a few slides. Um, sorry, as a scientist, I don't think we can talk without pictures. Um, so um, you have asked me to talk about um, the role of communities uh, in the climate emergency. Um, and um, I, um, I, I will do that on the first part of the talk, which is probably um, the slightly longer part. Uh, I will talk about how climate change affects communities because that is my my research and where I really have the expertise. So um, I thought that it's it's meaningful to talk about that. And then I will talk a bit about um, what communities, what I think um, communities can do and, and what the role of communities can be to deal with uh, the crisis. So it will be quite, so my research is quite different to the work um, from my colleagues who work on the lower carbon futures, for example, that you have collaborated with before, which is very much more working on the solutions and on, on very direct uh, yeah, aspects of how you, how what you can do with your own house to, to help uh, the, the climate crisis. So I will not go into any great details on that because other people can do that much better than I do. Um, so I'll start with what I know most about, and that is um, with um, extreme weather. So every time nowadays uh, an extreme weather event happens, the question is immediately asked, is this climate change? And um, until maybe about five years or a bit longer ago, um, the main answer or the main answers that you would get from the scientific community was either, well, you can't attribute individual weather events to climate change or, well, yeah, climate change is happening. So of course, all the weather events that are happening are happening in a different climate than uh, we had before. And the letter is trivially true but it doesn't tell you anything about how much climate change actually affected weather events. And so what um, my research and with, with my team here in Oxford, we have been trying to do is, or what, what we have been quite successfully done is to change this and actually say how we can attribute individual weather events to climate change. And the first thing um, to start with is to, um, to think about why we actually need to do this work, because um, we know that climate change is happening. Um, and so, well, of course, it will affect weather. But there are two ways of how climate affects weather. The first one is what we would call the thermodynamic effect, so the warming effect. Because we have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the atmosphere as a whole gets warmer. That means on a global average, we have a higher likelihood for heat waves, a lower likelihood for cold waves. A warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor that needs to get out of the atmosphere as rainfall. So on average, we also have more extreme rainfall. But there is a second way uh, how climate change affects weather, and that is 
by changing the composition of the atmosphere, we have changed the atmospheric circulation. So that means how weather systems develop, how they move, where they move. And this, this second effect is very different from region to region and also from season to season. And these two effects can either work together in the same direction. So you have from the warming alone, you have more rainfall, but then you also get more low pressure systems bringing in more rainfall. So you get even more extreme rain than you would expect from the warming alone. But these two effects can also work in the opposite direction. So you can, if you, you can expect as much rainfall as you like, but if you just don't get the low pressure systems anymore bringing the rainfall, then you will have in the region and that season actually no change in rainfall or even less rain if, if the dynamics win, if you like. And because we don't know from just looking at equations or, um, or any theoretical thinking which of how these two effects play together, we actually have to study events different weather events at the places where they occur to know what climate change actually means in the world we live in today. So how we do that? Um, first of all, it is really important to highlight that the question was this climate change is not a question that has a yes or no answer. Every extreme weather event or every weather event, extreme or not, has always many different causes. There's always a role of just the chaotic variability of the weather system. There are um, influences from whether the, um, the event is happening over a city, over a forest. Um, what, yeah, what was it? Um, is, is, for example, a heat wave happening after a very dry spring or after a very wet summer? All these things play an important role. But, and that is um, what we are trying to figure out in, in, our, um, in our studies how to do it, external drivers like more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, also known as climate change, can alter the likelihood and intensity of an extreme event to occur. And what, we, what you see on this slide is a, is a schematic of how this kind of work that we are doing is, is, is done. So the first question is, um, well, we have flooding in Oxfordshire. Was this climate change? So to answer that question, you first need to know what actually caused this flooding? Was it a one day extreme rainfall event or was it actually an extremely soggy winter season and just the, the very end of it has tipped rivers um, to go over in the floodplains? Or um, did it actually rain much further upstream and just through the hydrolo hydrology and maybe river management it flooded where it flooded. So, so this is the first question, what is actually the weather behind the damages and losses that, that, that leads people to be interested in the question? And having find an answer for that question, let it be, it was a, just a, a winter storm bringing a one day extreme rainfall event. Then we need to find out what is possible weather in the world we live in today? And that will um, give us, we can use observations of weather, so just data measured at weather stations and climate model simulations to find out what is possible weather in the world we live in today with climate change in Oxfordshire. So what is possible rainfall in the world we live in today? And then we might get something that looks a bit like this, red distribution here. This is just a schematic. It will, it will look different in real world. Um, and then we find that, okay, um, after this, um, everything that is above uh, a certain threshold, which is here, this dashed line, causes impacts, causes flooding. So we call that the extreme weather event. And then we find out that this extreme event has a likelihood to occur in the world we live in today of maybe one in 10 years. And then, because we know very well how many greenhouse gases have been added into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we can take these greenhouse gases out in, of the atmosphere of our climate models and so simulate the world that might have been without man-made climate change. 
And in that world, we then look again, what is possible weather in the world that might have been without climate change? And in this totally exaggerated schematic here, you then might get a different distribution. And in that world, the extreme event that causes losses and damages only has a likelihood to occur once in 100 years. And because the only difference between these two sets of experiments that we have done is climate change, we can then attribute the difference to man-made climate change. And this, is, um, and this is what we do when we do attribution of extreme weather events. In reality, the results look more like this, which is not quite so friendly for, for a non-scientific eye, or actually these kind of plots are really only loved by a hydrologist. Um, so if you're not a hydrologist, what you see here is basically exactly the same as in the slide before, but plotted in a so-called return time plot. So what you have here on the x-axis is the return time. So here, um, is in the, on the red curve, so the simulations. So every dot on this red curve is one simulation of possible weather, possible extreme rainfall in Britain, actually in this case, in the world we live in today. And so you have the one, one in a hundred year event um, has about 17 millimeters of rain per day in, in this case. And you also have the simulations of the world that might have been without climate change. And you find that the one in a hundred year event in that world has a slightly lower maximum uh, millimeters per day. So you only have maybe 15 millimeters per day. So you can say that the intensity of the one in a hundred year event has increased by about two millimeters because of climate change. Or you can look at it in the same way that I've just said before, you can say, okay, this event that has happened here that had a 12 millimeter of rainfall and actually caused a lot of flooding, that uh, is in today's world about a one in 20 year event, but in the world that might have been, it would only have occurred maybe once in 30 years. And so the likelihood of the event to occur has increased. But the increase is about, in this, in this real example, it's about 40%. So climate change did play a significant role, but it's not a game changer. It didn't completely change the nature of, um, of, of the rainfall events. So also without climate change, there would have been extreme rainfall, but it would have been slightly less. And of course, if your, if your house is on the edge of the floodplain, this slightly less or slightly more might make a huge difference. So um, I don't want to go into too much detail. I really just uh, wanted to give a brief flavor of the kind of, um, of yeah, so what, what the scientific process behind these studies is. Um, but here are some typical results that we have, um, that, that we have done with, with the in, the, in some of the studies that we have done in our team. And you see here, um, what you see here is um, in blue, in all these plots in blue, is um, the change in the likelihood of different types of extreme weather events to occur based on simulations of statistical simulations with observed weather data. So for example, when you focus on uh, on this heat wave in Germany last summer, you see this black bar in the middle of this huge blue bar. And so this means that based on statistical modeling with observations, we find that because of climate change, the heat wave in, Germ in Germany has been made about 500 times more likely. So this is this is the middle of this red bar. But actually, we can't quantify this increase in the likelihood very well, because there are we don't have that many observational data for especially for very extreme events like this one was one. So the uncertainty or the the statistical um, range of possible results is quite large. So it can be as low as 20 times more likely, and it can be as high as 100,000 times more likely. So 
not all the results that we obtain are as neat as the one I've just shown for, with Britain, uh, where we have about uh, a 40% increase, and that is relatively well constrained. But for things like he, he, local heat waves, so this is not in all of Germany, but in one city in Germany, um, the the um, the uncertainty in the scientific results is quite large. So we can't say the heat wave was made 100 times more likely or the heat wave might, was made 1,000 times more likely. But what we can say is we can say, what is the lower bound of all our estimates? Um, so the, all the red bars that you see here is the same estimates, but based on climate model simulations alone. And there you see that the climate models actually underestimate the warming in these heat waves quite a bit. And so we can use these to constrain what is the lower bound of these heat waves. And I know that these might all sound very statistical and, and very irrelevant, but I think it is really important to know that we can say for, for, for these localized heat waves that climate change has made them at least 10 times more likely. But that already is a huge change, change. So for heat waves, very much in contrast to extreme rainfall events, climate change is an absolute game changer. And we can't even say how much of a game changer it is because our climate models don't do a very good job in, in simulating these type of heat waves. So when we want to be prepared for climate change, the climate change that is happening already today has really changed the nature of what summers mean in Europe. And yeah, we can look at some other examples of, um, of, of studies that we have done. So here's extreme rainfall in Texas. Here we actually have the observations and climate models are doing a much better job and our understanding is, is much better in, in terms of how, how much climate change affects this kind of weather event. And there we see that climate change approximately doubled um, the likelihood of the events to occur. But in other parts of the world, so for example, the drought in Somalia that happened in 2010 and led to huge, um, it had huge impacts um, there. We can't, we could basically say that climate change did not play a major role because we can exclude from all our, our um, assessments that it was, it was making the event um, more than five times more likely or less than five times more likely, but we can't even say really how, what the sign of the change is. So in order to build resilience to climate change in, in these parts of the world where we have very sparse observations, so it's very hard to find out what is actually happening even today. And so we have also nothing to compare the climate models within really building resilience to to very variable weather is is the only the only way to go. So that was the the very sciencey bit of the talk, which might sound a bit unfriendly, but I think it is quite important um, to highlight on the one hand that science is evolving quite a lot. So things that we couldn't do five years ago and think things that we didn't know five years ago in climate change, we can actually say a lot about now, but also that there is still a lot of research to be done and, and a lot of things that we don't know as exactly as we would like to know, but we do know enough to know what we need to be prepared for. Um, and so it is, I think one of the important things really to do is to make sure that the kind of scientific information that is used to do any kind of, of, of planning is up to date and is also um, updated on a, on a regular basis. So um, we now can do these kind of attribution studies and there have been loads of them happening in the last five years around the world. So what that means is that we are slowly beginning to get a picture of what climate change actually means today for us 
on the scales were we actually making decisions on adaptation. So on the, on the geographical scales where people live in cities, in communities. And this is um, from Carbon Brief, a map uh, where it's a climate and energy um, news outlet, which they, they do a really good job in, in always re reporting on, on the latest climate science. And they have put this map together of all the attribution studies. And you can see that um, there are a lot of red dots. All the red dots mean that these are the types of events where climate change has made, has had an impact uh, on the extreme event that has happened. The blue ones are where climate change did not play a role. And the gray ones are the ones where we can't say. And so with our current understanding and our current tools, we, we can't answer the question. So for ex yeah, so the, I've shown the drought in, in Somalia. That was one example where we can't say as much as we would like to, but also other events like very small scale events, thunderstorms, hail is something where we don't have good climate models to answer the question of what the role of climate change is in these. But it's very important that these studies are not representative of all the events that happen today. They are focusing very much on events that happen in the developed world, in the world where, in the places where climate scientists sit. So Britain, there are loads of studies in Britain because there's a lot of climate science happening here. There are lots in North America and in Australia, but there are very few ones in Africa um, and South America and, and other places where, where no major scientific centers are. And also they are biased towards the events that we have good data on. So heat wave and rainfall events. So I have tried in a study, um, which is, is, is shown here, to, to, put, to, to somehow put on a map to illustrate how much we know about how weather uh, or how climate change affects our weather today. And what you see on this map is that all the red dots are death associated with extreme weather where potentially climate change could have played a big role. And it's, uh, it's death, not because I'm particularly morbid, but because death are um, an impact that is relatively good comparable across the world. If for example, you would take economic losses they are much higher where the assets are expensive, but that doesn't mean that they are more important in that part of the world. And so deaths are um, up in, in that way more equal. And so these red dots are all on the capitals of the countries. And so the larger the, larger the dot, the more death associated with extreme weather events. And then you see that in some countries, there are also black dots. And these black dots show for how many of these deaths we do know the role of climate change. It doesn't mean that they are all attributable or that are caused by climate change, but just there have been studies done and we understand how climate change affected these, these extreme events that led to these impacts. And there you see very clearly that um, most deaths in developed countries are associated with heat waves. And we have done a lot of studies on European heat waves. Um, this very big dot here is the Russian heat wave in 2010. Um, so there we have a good understanding of the role of climate change, but in many other cases, so these, this very large dot here is uh, a typhoon um, hitting Malaysia in the early 2000s where we just don't know what role climate change played in, in this effect. And this is, um, and I think this is, um, this might not seem terribly relevant for for Oxfordshire, but I think it is really it is really important for the whole for understanding climate science that it is still very much biased towards our understanding of weather in developed countries, and there are huge gaps in our knowledge in terms of what the impacts of climate change mean on in in, in large parts of the world. So, for example, there are often you hear often numbers about climate refugees and projected climate refugees, but we actually don't have evidence to to really estimate these numbers. So that there, there are this is one area where there are huge gaps in in our knowledge and where I think 
we all have a duty um, as as um, inhabitants of the developed world to to help build capacities for, for research to be done on and, and especially in other parts of the world. So that was um, what I wanted to say about my own work. Um, and now I really just want to be to very briefly say um, a few things that I think are important um, when when you ask, okay, what can I do? What can we as a community, as a community in, in Oxfordshire um, actually do to change this massive global problem? Because um, of course, what is clear, I've shown that we have made a lot of progress in understanding what climate change means on the scales where people live today, but that there's also a lot of open questions. But where, of course, there is no question is that climate change is happening and that it's it's happening because of the burning of fossil fuels and that the only way to stop temperatures from rising further is to stop burning fossil fuels or at least to stop uh, getting the emissions from the burning of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And I think in especially in the last few years there have been has been a switch from where a lot of the discussion before was focusing very much on climate change denial and very much um, trying to get the message across that climate change is happening and now the debate has switched to the opposite end where there is a lot uh, of um, debate or a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of voices saying that it's too late. We only have 12. There was this message that a while back when around that it's only that we only have 12 years to stop climate change and that we are already doomed or there are lots of actually a lot of people seem to attribute the uh, the fires in California exclusively to climate change. And, and so uh, and it seems that there is yeah, so that there has not never been really a window between everything was denial and now it's all doom. But of course, both is is not helpful. Um, denying climate change is certainly uh, not helpful at all. But also, this narrative of of doom and um, hopelessness, I think, is really not helpful because it it gives the impression that we are powerless to do something about it. And, and that is very much not what we are, but it is, it is on us and it is in our hands to change um, our global society from a society that depends on the burning of fossil fuels to a society that does not do that. Um, and, and I think what, but what we need to do um, that is very systematic change. And I think the most and to to achieve this very systematic thing uh, change, the most important thing is to educate people about climate change, about what climate change really means, not about some horror stories that one might hear or about some some fake news that one might hear, but what is the reality of climate change? And I think this is something where communities can play a huge role in providing materials providing educational materials that that does um, that does help uh, to to talk about climate change and I fear this guy is uh, if you google you in YouTube climate Adam so he uh, was a, a default student here so a postdoc and uh, not a doctoral student here in Oxford and is now a climate journalist and he does fantastic very funny videos about climate science um, so if you can't be asked to read the IPCC report, which I would not recommend to read completely because it's very dull, um, then then this is there are really good resources out there. And one role of a community of a community organization can be to find these and to help people access these. And well, of course, the summary for policymakers of the IPCC report is also something that is very useful to read because it's very short and it always gives the most up-to-date science. And I think this is really important 
to have the most up-to-date science because things do change. Sometimes just listening, I was just listening the other day to uh, Prince William talking about climate change and he was talking about population increase and how 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 important it is uh, how important the role population increase global population increase is is playing and that was true um maybe 10 years ago still or a bit longer um it looked as if overpopulation would be a real problem but this has actually changed the rate of global population increase is 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 slowing down so it is decreasing and there we have actually as a global society managed to to change something that looked like a huge problem so through a lot of very grassroots work and educating women um, providing education more generally we have turned um, the curve on population growth so I think this is this is one good example of why you need to be up to date with with what are actually the problems, but also how we can actually solve problems that seem very, very hard to solve. And I would like to finish um, with a, a quote from a fantastic colleague of mine, Kate Marvel. She is a climate scientist in uh, uh, in she, she lives in New York. Now I forgot which uh, NASA Goddard. That's that's the institution she is. So she she's a scientist, but she also writes a lot. And she, one of the things she said is that we don't need that we need courage, not hope, to face climate change. And I think um, this is um, this is very much true because we need to have really large scale systematic change. And to do that, um, we need to be to have courage to do things differently and that means not differently in okay we exchanged every internal combustion engine with an electric one but really we completely change what we think about uh, or what we yeah what we do when we think about mobility and how how our cities look like and i really like this image a lot which shows just how stupid for example our cities are um, so if you had your house uh, designed in the same way that our cities are designed, it would look something like this. Um, and and so this, you would never have a house like that, but our cities are all like that. And we think it's it has to be like that. And I think this is really just to highlight, we as communities, communities are a small enough uh, group so that you can actually come together, talk together, and brainstorm and we can't do that on a global scale but we can do that at a community and then also be brave to um and have the courage to do things radically different and not not be afraid that you might offend someone well you will always offend someone if you change something but you can will also at the same time make a lot of lives a lot better and i think this is really what communities can can demonstrate, and yeah, I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, I can I can share the slides with you if we like, because I if if you're interested, because there are the the references. But yeah, it's also not essential. They are really easy to find on the World Weather Attribution website. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Freddie. Um, it's a super interesting talk, um, very sobering data within there, um, but ending on a very hopeful note as well with the you know the changes that um, that we can all make. Um, we've been having some questions coming in, um, but I wanted to uh, well just encourage people to send in some more questions as as the as they come to them when we go through this Q&A session. But I just wanted to first shamelessly abuse my own position as host <laughs> and ask you a question myself, um, thinking about you know, the transformative change that's, that's, that's needed to deal with this, this issue. Um, if you had to pick out, I don't know, your, your top two or three instant public policy transformations that we'd need to implement in this country in the next 10, 15 years to, to really start to do something about this problem quickly, 
what would what would they be? So I think um, in particular in this country, well, but actually probably in, in most other countries as well, housing would be one where um, where really we need legislation now that um, that new houses are not built anymore that are just not compatible with uh, with a net zero um, society and we don't we are not there yet um, so and, and we actually knew that a long time ago that this is what is needed so I think this is really because as a as a business owner as a as a builder you just without legislation you have no planning security you have no planning horizon and of course you don't change what you do because you just don't know what the the framework is in which you operate so i think this this is one of the most important things that needs to happen now um and um yeah i, th I think this this is really um and uh, i think very similarly it's um with um with how how we generate electricity and how we generate power so that just that there are still subsidies to fossil fuels it, it's just it makes no sense in 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 and so that that will be um and uh, maybe given that i only have two i would frame that one a little bit differently. I think one thing that we don't talk a lot about when we talk about climate change is lobbying and lobbyism. And uh, I, I see that particularly stark in, in my home country, Germany. So every time any decision or anything happens on a political scale, the car lobby is, is sitting at, at the same uh, tables as the politicians and basically no one else. And that's how decisions are made, and 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 this is something where I don't think we talk enough about that. Who has actually access to policymakers, and and that needs to change. So that that will be my top two. Excellent, good choice. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Well, I'll, I'll pass over to Emily, who's been uh, keeping an eye on the questions, and we'll bring in everybody else just now. Yes. Yeah, so, I think I'm going to just sort of if there's similar ones I'll put them together potentially but actually I think just you started off by saying or after you sort of talked about the extreme weather that obviously climate change facilities are relatively good in developing countries but absolutely not in underdeveloped countries and obviously I can I can there must be finance with that but why is that and also another question that builds onto that if I may add it is even even if even if there is that sort of difference between developing and developed countries do you so here she's put here you mentioned that data on extreme weather events is poorer from less developed areas does earth observation satellite data mitigate for that absence um so i think i'll, I'll start with the first question of why why that is um so a, a lot of that is um um, yeah, just 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 really the the effects of colonialism um, that um, and and the way just that 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 we have decided how isn't how science is done um, and 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 also then went ahead and, and did it, whereas um, not um, yeah that just not not allowing the the colonized countries to to do something about so we are we are the, the whole science community is definitely very much still coming out of 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 that and um and also um a bit of it is also prestige so every um especially in climate science building a climate model is very expensive so every every country um every Develop, big developed country has built their own climate model and of course that was very expensive and then these simulations were there and so all the scientists in that country have used these models and so um, there has been very little sharing of data very because it was so expensive um, 
So you only had access to actually the data if you were sitting in, in the country with, with, where these models were. And this, this has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. So now all the modeling centers in the world share all their data globally and everyone can access this and use it. But that of course has only really changed in the last 10 years. And so that this change that, that you now actually can do research from other parts of the world, of course, the capacities need to grow and need to need to build. So there are ch things that that change um, very uh, that that have changed a lot. But at the moment, it is also often so that in most of the developing world, research is not institutionalized. So the universities and people working at universities, their job is to teach. Um, they have to teach so much that there is just no time to do research. And those that work in, in, in weather forecasting centers focus on providing these services for the weather forecast. It's just that research is, is not an institutional part of, of the landscape. And of course, that, that makes it also difficult. And these things are changing and are being recognized, but it takes a long it's time. Slow. Yeah. Okay. And if satellites can mitigate some of the, um, yes, so definitely the data situation is much better since the beginning of the satellite area, but um, especially for things like rainfall. So satellites don't measure rainfall, they measure cloud depth and uh, the properties of clouds that are conducive to rain. But um, you have to calibrate these um, these satellites so that actually what the satellite measures is sort of put into context of what that actually means in millimeters on the ground. And so if you don't have the data to calibrate that, your satellite data will, will never be as, as good as the station data. And also satellites don't, um, yeah, they, they don't look at all spots all the time. So they, if especially flash floods and short bursts of rainfall that they are just missed uh, by by the satellites. So it's definitely a lot, lot better than it could have been and than it was. But it seems that there's still quite a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. OK, a, a quite a I'm going to stick with the sort of more science questions, at least the science for me and I'm a novice, so who knows, might not be. So here we've got a question here. Is the climate crisis getting too much of the policy attention relative to the biodiversity crisis? The solutions are not necessarily complementary, which is a risk to the, the latter. Also, evidence suggests that one of the root causes of the latter, deforestation and wildlife exploitation, resulted in the current pandemic, which has had obviously quite a big impact. Um, I I think we are definitely running a risk um, of playing crisis against each other. And, um, and I think this pandemic is a good example of that. Um, but I actually, I don't think I would agree that a lot of the solutions to the climate crisis are, are, are very dissimilar to solutions mm -hmm. to biodiversity crisis, because in order to, um, to adapt to a changing climate and to um, to to and and we we already have climate change, so we need to adapt if we want it or not. A lot of that is that the more green space you have, the the lower the temperatures will be in a heat wave, and so so there are actually a lot of win wins from biodiversity conservation and 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 adaptation. Um, I think I would completely agree that they don't get as much attention um, and and enough attention um, that in 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 comparison to um, to other to things like the more industrial focused aspects of uh, of, of climate change mitigation. Yeah. So no need to fight against each other. Who's the biggest crisis? Absolutely. No, I think I think I would I would probably agree that it's not terribly helpful to say that climate change is the most important crisis because there are other things that are happening and and mm -hmm. there are other problems that we have to deal with and I think um, and actually one reason of why I think 
the attribution work that I'm doing is important is because we also find out where climate change is not a major driver. Um, and, and, and so, but, and then you can find out, okay, what, what, why are then the impacts of these weather events so large? So, um, what, what are other causes and, and, and these, these need to be addressed. And I think this is, yeah, this disentangling drivers of disasters and, and, and trying to address them in a, in a way that actually will help, uh, to avoid disasters and not avoid climate change is, is the way to go. Yeah, okay. okay. So this is about economic growth. The drive for economic growth is central to the current system. In Oxfordshire, this is expressed by the plans for a new Oxford to Cambridge motorway and one million new homes. How can this be compatible with com combating climate change and what can local communities do about it? Um, I think definitely Th that that we still build motorways it seems really stupid because it, it is even more nature that gets destroyed so that is not one motorway more or less might not make a huge difference for climate change but it definitely makes a huge difference for local biodiversity and local ecosystems um, and so um, I, I think this is this is def this is very much 20th century thinking, and this is why I thought we really need courage to challenge that and change that. Um, I don't think necessarily that um, you can't have economic growth at all uh, with in a, in a sustainable system. So I would I would caution for saying uh, for saying oh we have to get rid of capitalism otherwise. Um, we will not solve this crisis because I don't think we uh, I don't think we have an alternative system that actually works. Um, so I think making the the capitalist system uh, sustainable is is a more um, realistic and more, and probably also yeah more much much more useful and pragmatic way to say okay how can we use the system the 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 economic system so that is more um, sustainable and sustainable really means better for people and better for 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 the environment yeah i've, I've never quite understood why we we have the strategy to build more roads and therefore more cars that it still blows my mind so 20th century thinking probably makes sense okay next so uh, the recently adopted oxford local plan requires all new houses a 40% reduction in carbon emissions from existing building regulations. The impact will be that houses are more expensive to build in a city with some of the least affordable housing in the UK. How can we overcome the cost of greener technology? Good question. That, um, I think that is a good question, but I don't think it's actually the real problem in Oxfordshire because the price of the house is not what makes houses housing unaffordable uh, in 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 this city? It's the price of the land. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, uh, and and that. Um, so I think the changes that need to be made. And of course, at the moment, it is hugely expensive to build uh, a, a passive house or a or a, a greenhouse because all the standard houses that all the building societies offer are not. Uh, compatible with, uh, with with passive house standards because they don't have to because there is not the legislation. So I think the way to get the prices down for green houses is to get the legislation. And then it is actually not that much more expensive to build a passive house if 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 this if if you if you standardize it in the same way that you now do with not so great houses. But that that has very little to do with the problem that we have in Oxfordshire that just the price of the land is uh, is so expensive because of course everyone wants to live here um, and I have no idea how to solve that problem. Okay. Absolutely it's a big question. Okay I think this is probably have to be the final question. Would you call COVID-19 a part of climate change? No. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I, I no, it's not. It's not. It clim well, climate change is burning of fossil fuels and therefore more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and therefore atmosphere changing, weather changing, sea level rise and so on, which which is enough of a problem. But um, the the pandemic is is a different problem and it's it it is caused by unsustainable dealings with nature but it's not climate change not even indirectly no <laughs> great thank you very much but i think um what covid19 shows us and what this whole year 2020 has really shown us very dramatically is that we are very vulnerable mm -hmm. as a global society and that it doesn't take a a huge dramatic tipping point to, or, or something or a, a huge physical disaster but that just small changes in the virus or in the weather actually get us very much to the edge of what we are uh, what we are adapted to deal with. Great well thank you very much for that Freddie. Um, it's so I, I really need to topic lots of stuff to get our, our teeth and minds into um i'm thinking about you know i mean the absence of a an alternative waiting in the wings to to capitalism that we can roll out i guess you know but my my concern and probably that of others is as well as if we're going to get the reform of capitalism that you talk about in time uh to affect the changes that we need to make in, 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 in the near future to avoid catastrophic changes. Um, and the role of communities within that is, is so all important as, as, as you said. I mean, we can all do stuff ourselves. We can all get active and start lobbying within our own communities, start linking up with others to start forcing that, um, you know, more radical options from, from the grassroots and pushing at the boundaries of, of political doability and you know changing policy um, i mentioned neighborhood planning at the start of um, you know, in my introduction people wanting to use that tool in particular get as much out of it as they can to do as much as they can about the climate uh, climate emergency and, and and other issues um thank you so much for your time and um, it's been much much appreciated um I, I, i've learned a lot and hope everybody else has who's been listening tonight as well hey this was the second of our centenary talks for, uh, yeah, CFO's 100th birthday. Um, one more tomorrow night with the Shadow Chancellor, Annalise Dodds, who will be talking about housing in Oxfordshire and uh, across the UK and that, that massive issue um, and what we can potentially collectively do about that as well. So hopefully people watching tonight will, will join us tomorrow night. And of course, you yourself, Freddie, are, are welcome to come along and, and, and offer your opinion as well. Um, so just a couple of things to finish. We'll be posting the recordings of these webinars on the CFO YouTube channel, and they'll be available through our website too. So please um, drop into any that you might have missed um, in the next couple of weeks when, when we get them up there. And we'll be keeping you posted. Um, please drop into our website for future information about additional birthday plans that we've we've got coming up in the across the next year, um, one of which is a a writing competition, um, a theme very dear to, to myself. And we're gonna be having a creative writing competition on the theme of what else would it be, community. So um, as I say, drop into our website and uh, keep up to date with, with all our centenary plans. So thank you very much to everybody for, for watching and um, I hope you have an enjoyable rest of your evening.